Welcome to the RE Podcast, the first dedicated RE podcast for students and teachers. Episode 1. The one where humans are good. My name is Louisa Jane Smith and this is the RE Podcast, the podcast for those of you who think RE is boring, which it is, and I'll prove it to you. We are going to be exploring the question of whether humans are inherently good or bad. I know, I've used the word inherently in the second sentence. Don't panic. It means by nature, and I promise I won't use it again. Some of you listening might think that humans are generally good. Others might think that humans are basically selfish. Some of you might not have any idea either way or think we're all a bit of both. I do what I want when I'm wanting to. My soul, so cynical. This lyric from Billie Eilish's Bad Guy suggests that maybe deep down we are all selfish and cynically assume others are too. But is this actually true? The first thing I want to talk about is Christianity and the Bible. See, I told you it was going to be boring. Christianity is the biggest religion in the world. One in every three people claim to be Christians. So what does Christianity teach about whether humans are good or bad? Well, initially, they were good. In Genesis, the first book of the Bible, God made everything and then looked at it all and concluded it was very good. See, not just good, but very good. Fantastic, that's answered it. According to the biggest religion in the world, humans are very good end of podcast. But hang on a minute, that isn't quite the end of the story. Rape, murder, genocide, bullying, pollution, I hear you thinking. Yes, I can read your minds. It feels like maybe God was a little naive in his initial conclusion. Well, Christianity goes on to tell a story that while humans started good, they then disobeyed God by eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, from which God had told them pretty clearly not to eat from, or they will die. This all happens in Genesis chapter 3. So, human beings had everything. A perfect garden to live in, a friendship with God, harmony with nature, nice enough weather that they didn't have to worry about clothes, and all the food with seeds in it that they could eat. But even in this paradise, they took the one thing they weren't allowed. Now, Was this God's fault for putting temptation in their way? We all know that we want what we can't have. Or was it humans' fault for being weak and ultimately disobedient and selfish, considering temporary pleasure more appealing than long-term security? But is this still God's fault for making us flawed? The Christian story continues to suggest that, as humans, we are sinful. The Catholic tradition teaches we are born sinful. That's why they baptise babies, so they can be cleansed of their sin. Other traditions suggest that we soon learn it. And the punishment for that sin? Death. And not just death, but an eternity in hell. Thankfully, Christianity provides a way out of this. That Jesus, God's son, was crucified even though he was innocent. This death that he received should have been ours. Essentially, he died in our place so that if we believe in him, we will be forgiven of all of our sin. It's as though our sin never happened and we are perfect enough to go to heaven. This is a lovely happy ending, but it still teaches Christians that humans are essentially bad. We don't get to heaven because we're good enough. We are absolutely not good enough. The Bible says it's by faith you have been saved, not works. So even though we are wretched, awful people. God has found a way past this. He's forgiven us. It's called grace. Grace is being given something we don't deserve and it is the most fundamental teaching in Christianity. Later on in the Bible, after Jesus had died, a guy called Paul wrote a letter to the Romans. I know you've heard of the Romans, you know, the ones with the empire and the red and gold outfit and the gladiators and the numerals. They're kind of infamous. Paul, you may not have heard of. Well, he used to be called Saul and he worked for the Romans after Jesus had been crucified. His job was to catch illegal Christians. Well, they were following the teachings of a convicted criminal. And once he'd caught them, he would hand them over to the Romans for torture and imprisonment. Anyway, on one of his missions to hunt down some Christians, he ended up becoming a Christian. 
very long story, deal with it another time. And as a Christian, he was in prison. And while in and out and back in of prison, he wrote loads of letters to the new Christians. Surprisingly, some Romans had converted to Christianity. And this is what Paul, oh yeah, so he changed his name so no one would recognise him. Brilliant, right? Saul to Paul, no one would ever guess. Anyway, he said this, bear with me. I'm going to read from the Bible. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, I know this might be a bit complicated, but it's basically saying that it seems to be much easier to do the wrong thing and so much harder to do the right thing. Do you relate to this? I certainly do. I want to be patient with my children, but it seems to come so much more naturally to be impatient with them. Now, it's not just Christianity. Other religions have a similar idea. Islam teaches that Allah has to be merciful and compassionate to us, that we must complete duties to counter out our wrongdoings, and these will be weighed up against each other in the final judgment, and hopefully, fingers crossed, we are good enough. Even Buddhism, that doesn't even have a god, says that life is essentially unsatisfactory because we are selfish. We have a sense of self and ego, but it's an illusion. But we spend so much effort focusing on it, but in order to find happiness, we have to deny the self, and this takes practice. But these are religions. What does science or history or archaeology say? In 1976, even before I was born, Richard Dawkins published a book called The Selfish Gene, and it was this book that really put him on the map. If you read it, well, well you don't really need to read it to get the gist. It suggests that we are fundamentally driven by genes that are trying to survive. This selfish need defines our behaviour as humans, and often this is at odds with morality, a kind of biological hunger games. Way before this, in 1954, a British author called William Golding wrote a book called Lord of the Flies. I'm sure you've heard of it and maybe even read it, but if you haven't, it is about a group of children who get stranded on a deserted island. Despite their attempts to organise themselves and work together to survive, they become lazy and they bully each other and focus a lot more on fun than survival, similar to the first humans in the Garden of Eden. They get angry with each other and even commit murder. I think this is how some of us view humans, that when it comes down to it, we don't really like doing the right thing. Well, did you know that there was a real-life Lord of the Flies where schoolchildren got stranded on a desert island called Atta? And did they end up killing each other in a manic evil frenzy as in the fictional book? No. They worked together as a team, survived for over a year and then got rescued and remain friends to this day. But this kind of story doesn't sell papers. So stop for one minute. Take a look inside. What evidence do you find there? Think of everything you have done in your life. Every second of every minute of every day. On balance, have you done more bad than good or more good than bad? I would imagine it's more good than bad. Are you perfect? I doubt it. But you are not bad. You might have chatted in lessons or been grumpy with your parents, mean to your brother, not done some homework. But you are essentially a good person. So maybe it's everyone else. You're okay. It's everyone else that's bad. So think about every person you have met in your life. On balance, have these people been mostly kind to you or mostly mean? I'm thinking that most of you might be thinking the same thing, that generally people have been mostly kind to you. So if you're okay, and most people we have met are okay, then maybe humans are okay. I know, I know, the Holocaust, I hear you. But can good people do bad things sometimes? Yes. Does that mean we are bad? Not necessarily. There is no doubt that this is one of our history's greatest atrocities. Maybe this is evidence enough that humans are not that good or 
Maybe good people are capable of doing horrific things in certain circumstances. I want to tell you about an experiment that seems to demonstrate two things. One, that humans are good. And two, why good humans sometimes do the wrong thing. The experiment was done by a group of researchers at Yale University in something called the Baby Lab. They discovered that babies as young as three months old not only know right from wrong, but prefer right. Well, how do they know this? They showed babies a puppet show. In the puppet show, there was a puppet who was kind and a puppet that was unkind. When offered the puppets to play with, 80% of the children chose the kind puppet. Next, they were given another choice between two snacks. Once they had made their choice, they are shown two puppets. One that liked the same snack as them, the other that liked the other snack. When given the choice of these two puppets, they chose the one that had the same snack preference as them. Even when this puppet was unkind, they remained loyal to it. This tells us a lot about why sometimes good people do bad things. In interviews with former German soldiers and in taped conversations with German prisoners of wars, a message came through. They were not motivated by German ideology or by hatred of the enemy or even fear of their leaders. They were motivated by Kameradschaft, friendship. In fact, it's interesting to look at statistics in various wars throughout history about how many soldiers actually fired their weapons. On average, about 20%. Let me repeat a story from an amazing book called Humankind, a warm hug of a book. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. In the Second World War, Hitler decided the best way to win the war was to destroy the British human spirit. And the best way to do this? Bomb the crap out of London. Voila, the Blitz. And did it work? Hell no. It actually strengthened the human spirit. People continued to make tea, Children continued to play in the streets. Shops were more open than usual, one of the shop signs said. Fantastic humour. But then, England did the same thing back to Germany. Didn't work with us, thought England, but Germans are very different types of people. They don't have the stiff upper lip, the keep calm and carry on mentality. And did it work? No. The German people also banded together and made the best of it. Even in the Holocaust... There were stories of immense human kindness, including people offering their life in replace of someone else. On September the 11th, 2001, in the attack on the Twin Towers, people trying to escape were letting others go in front of them, were helping people down the stairs. Complete selfless acts. After Hurricane Katrina, there were fallacious reports of looting and rapes in the aftermath of the disaster, and the press were eager to print these. However, when researchers went in after this, they heard story after story about kindness and compassion and charity. We see the same thing happen in COVID. The greatest disaster of this generation, I've been told. And while some bad things have happened, what was the experience of most humans? They appreciated medical staff. They got to know their neighbours. They volunteered help to those in need. They reconnected with old friends. They sang in the streets. They learnt new skills. I'd also like to offer a personal anecdote. Tickets had sold out to see one of my favourite bands uh, in my hometown. I was gutted. But a few months later, I saw one being sold on Facebook for cost price. I messaged the seller and we discussed whether she would forward the e-ticket to me first and then trust me to pay, or whether I should pay up front and trust her to forward the ticket. In the end, we agreed that I would pay half before and half once I had received the ticket. But this still had to be based on trust. Once I had paid half the ticket, I had to trust that she would send the ticket. And after she had sent the ticket, she had to trust that I would pay the rest of the money. And do you know what happened? I paid half. She sent the ticket. I paid the full amount. I came away from that experience totally jubilant at the beautiful exchange of trust between two strangers. So maybe the question is this, what is most helpful for us to believe? That people are inherently good or that people are inherently bad? 
I know, I know, I've used the word inherently again. I said I wouldn't, but I have a feeling you know what it means right now. Do we want to live our lives by fear and hate or love and hope? Do we want to view ourselves as good or bad people? Is there anyone who profits from me believing that people are bad? What about arms dealers or governments or insurance companies? Would they lose anything if we all started to believe that people are good? In my classroom, I ask my students to imagine a world where the seas are made of chocolate. I'm going to invite you to do that now. Now think of as many positives that would come of that. Mm -hmm, I'm thinking of free, never-ending chocolate. Now think of any negatives. Yes, the obvious one is quite revolting. Think about it. Now what interesting questions or comments do you have? Would different seas be different types of chocolate? So a white chocolate sea or a dark chocolate sea or a milk chocolate sea? Would it rain chocolate? By now, you are probably realising that what appeared on the surface to be a great thing actually turned out not to be that great. The truth is, every living thing would die if the world's seas were made of chocolate. Let's do the same with today's topic. Imagine a world where everyone believed everyone else was good. Think of as many positives that would come out of that. Now think of any negatives. What interesting questions or comments do we have? Would the world be better or worse if we believed humans were basically good? What might be interesting is that, like with the chocolate seas, your initial thought was probably not correct. On the surface, believing everyone is good is a ridiculous idea. But maybe, just maybe... It's the best idea we've ever had. If you've got a piece of paper and a pen to hand, then please write this down. If not, just try and think about it in your head. Here we go. One times one equals one. I'm sorry, it's maths. Bear with me. Two times two equals four. Three times three equals nine. Four times four equals 15. What do you notice? The 15, right? It's wrong. 4 times 4 does not equal 15. 4 times 4 equals 16. But those two digits, that 1 and the 5, is the only thing that is wrong. Everything else is completely correct. And actually, 15 is right. Numbers can't be wrong. 15 is 15. But the sum as a whole is wrong. But of all of those things that were right, you just noticed the one thing that was bad. And this might be how we live our life. We don't notice the good. We only notice the wrong. And that makes us believe that people are mostly bad. So what do I think? Are humans good or bad? I would argue, mostly good. So let's celebrate this and start noticing the good we are ignoring and ignoring the bad, which is the exception to the rule. And even if it's not actually true, I think living as though it is would make the world a much better place. I would really value your thoughts, opinions, feedback and questions, so please post them in the show notes below. Next week, I will be asking the same question about religion. Is it a force for good or the worst evil there is? I am Louisa Jane Smith. This has been the RE Podcast, a podcast for people who think RE is boring, which it is. I just proved it. But thank you so much for listening to me bore the life out of you. <laughs>